Hello everybody, welcome to the first installment of a songwriter's notes on songwriting. Um, glad you're here. My name is Dan Colbert and in this series of 10 to 12 videos I'm gonna uh, share with you what I've learned over the years about songwriting uh, over several decades, uh, well over a hundred songs to show for it. And I hope this is both useful and uh, interesting and enjoyable for you. Uh, before I tell you about myself, let me tell you a little bit about you. Uh, who's this series intended for? Uh, it's really both for aspiring and practicing songwriters. If you've never written a song before, but started and gotten stuck, uh, as many of us have, I'm hoping that these discussions will help you on your way. And if you're already an experienced songwriter, I hope you'll benefit from and enjoy hearing uh, my experiences in songwriting and what I've learned. Uh, like all art forms, songwriting is essentially a, a lonely uh, experience, so sharing can be meaningful in a whole lot of ways. Uh, I always love to hear how other songwriters approach their craft, and I get a lot out of it usually. And I'll share some of what I've heard uh, with you uh, throughout this series. One thing I'm going to assume about you as a, um, as a listener in this uh, series is that you know how to play an instrument, um, most importantly, uh, guitar or keyboard, which are the primary songwriting tools, but it could be anything. Uh, that you know how to play it to the level of at least being able to play a simple song. So you don't have to be very advanced by any means, but just uh, that you know some chords on each instrument enough to uh, play a simple song at least. It's better, of course, if you have at least a couple years of experience with the instrument so that you've developed your ear uh, at least a little and learned the, the very basics of music theory things like what a chord is, major, minor, intervals, things like that. In fact, that's most of the theory that you'll need right there, uh, what I just said. Uh, you don't need a lot of technique on your instrument to really get started in songwriting. If you can strum on the guitar a few, uh, you know, three or four chords, you're already well on your way to being able to write a song. Uh, same on the piano. Uh, before I go too far into this, uh, you know, I, I want to kind of uh, contrast a little bit with what you might find out there on songwriting, particularly in YouTube land. Uh, so I searched YouTube uh, for how to write a song, and I got mostly videos on songwriting for beginners. That makes sense, right? Experienced songwriters don't need help, huh? Well, maybe, but I think we can all benefit from hearing others' experiences and benefit uh, enormously, as I said earlier. Uh, uh, I do when I hear or read my musical heroes uh, share their processes and experiences. Paul Simon, who's one of my heroes in particular, has taught me lots of invaluable things, which I'll try to remember to pass along to you in this series. Um, my hope is that at least some of what I offer here will be at least interesting to you and hopefully of some value in your songwriting. One of the first things that came up in my search uh, about on YouTube about songwriting was uh, 10 simple steps to writing a song, as though songwriting is a prescriptive process. Uh, I can tell you it's not, um, and this series is really meant to be the opposite of prescriptive, as you'll see as we go along. The first step in this video was write a catchy melody. <laughs> um, you'll agree, I think, that this is not very helpful, right? This, and this is not the approach that, that I'm going to take. Uh, what I'm hoping is to give you some insight into how a nice melody might arise naturally in your songwriting art as you develop your own process. Uh, or rather, really, I'll discuss how, they, how, how a melody arises in my process, which again may or may not be helpful or interesting to you. In fact, once I have some basic elements of a song, when I'm writing a song, I kind of get melody pretty much for free, 
and I'll talk more about that later. Um, uh, I certainly would advise not starting with a melody. I think you want to start with the foundations, which is harmony, and we'll talk a little bit about today and next time. Now, who am I, and why would you take time to listen to what I have to say about songwriting? I had a career outside of music, but music's always been my main interest. Uh, I've been a musician since age 10, including some formal training, but that's not necessary. Uh, you won't have heard of any of my songs, probably, though I've won awards for some of them. I'm a better songwriter than a marketer, which is kind of important these days to, to know how to market. I'm just an ordinary guy who plays a little guitar, sings a little, neither particularly great. I know a little about music, so good chance uh, uh, I'm something like you. And meaning you can write songs too if you're motivated to do so. So that's what this is about. The key for me really in writing songs is to have a good ear uh, and to have some taste and a little knowledge about what makes a good song. And that's what I'm here to share with you. And by the way, and this is really important, a belief that you can create something worth listening to and that others will want to listen to. It's important to believe in your own art making, whatever your art is. Uh, speaking of taste, everyone's is different. Everyone has different preferences and influences. The things I'm going to share are, are mainly pretty universal things about songwriting that should apply across all genres. Uh, in fact, I'll cut to the chase right now and tell you that my number one secret to songwriting is simply to fool around with your instrument. Uh, just noodle. That's it. Uh, it's great to develop some technique, but you don't need uh, to have uh, uh, great technique or be a great musician uh, with pyrotechnics. For instance, a lot of people um, feel that Randy Newman is one of the best songwriters of his time. And, and he plays very simply on the piano, very simply. Listen to some of his songs. It's, it's real simple stuff. Uh, and his songs reflect that. On the other hand, Jeff Beck is, in my opinion, the greatest guitar wizard ever, but he didn't write a whole lot of songs. Uh, and I could go on and on with that. I'm sure you have uh, thoughts of your own on that. You don't need to be a wizard on your instrument, but you do need a willingness to explore around it, a curiosity, a musical curiosity about finding new chords, new sounds, new voicings. We'll talk about that, all that later on. Allow yourself to make mistakes. Some of my favorite musical moments in my songs have come out of uh, using chords that I found by putting my fingers in the wrong place as I was going for a chord, I made a mistake. And they ended up uh, teaching me something and being uh, a beautiful part of uh, a song I was writing. Uh, those kinds of mistakes also will help you to develop your ear. Uh, and they'll open up new musical directions for you that align with your unique sensibilities. I have more to tell you, uh, a lot more to tell you, but just fooling around with your instrument is probably the single most important thing that you can do and, and advice that I can give you. Uh, much more on that in another episode and throughout this series. Uh, let me say a word about genre since I mentioned it before, and this is just a personal thing for me. A lot of people... Um, when I'm getting ready to play with other musicians or um, uh, talk to people about my songs, music, they'll ask, what is my genre? And I kind of bristle at that a little bit. Uh, uh, it's my own genre, you know, and like all songwriters, um, we all have influences. I have influences from uh, folk, folk rock, hard rock, jazz, classical, and it all gets stirred up in the old noggin and synthesized into me or you. Own it. Love it. Like any art form, songwriting is an expression of you. Even if you um, 
overtly imitate someone else, it's still going to come out as you. So don't sweat genre. Um, uh, it doesn't matter. So finally, before we get into the subject matter for today, this is all by way of introduction, uh, why am I doing this series? Um, there are two main reasons. One, as a former teacher, I love discussing and passing things that I've learned along to other people. I mean, I really love it. And two, quite honestly, I'm hoping that this might be a way to get my songs heard by more people. Uh, I'm going to use my songs as examples of what I'm talking about, along with uh, uh, songs, uh, famous songs that you've all heard. Um, uh, even though the most important reason that I write is for myself, I mean, Every artist, and make no mistake, songwriting is an art, wants to be seen, read, or heard. Um, so, uh, again, I'll be using my own songs to illustrate points that I make, and I'll provide links to them on my channel. They're all on my channel. So there you have it. Um, and again, uh, before we uh, get into the subject matter, let me just say a few words this one time about how these videos are organized. Uh, don't hold me to this, but I'm uh, gonna try to do one of these uh, every week, about 10 or 12 in all. Uh, each video, uh, which I plan to be about 20 or 30 minutes in length, will have a theme. Today's is on uh, simple chord progressions, and next week we'll talk about spicing up your chord progressions. Another will be about rhythm, another on melody, another maybe two on lyrics, writing. So all the basic elements of music and songwriting. So it's pretty straightforward in organization. The last thing before we jump into today's subject matter, um, I just want to say I have a lot of uh, friends who are really good musicians who want to write uh, but don't know where to start or they start and they get stuck. Uh, I have a friend who's been writing his first song for many, many years, and uh, he just doesn't know kind of uh, how to plow through with that. Uh, whether you've never tried before or are one of the stuck ones, I hope these videos are a help. After all, uh, and I'll come back to this again and again throughout these videos, almost nothing is more worthwhile than expressing yourself. Okay, So I wish you all the luck in your songwriting, whether these are helpful or not. So let's get started, okay? How do you start to write a song? Well, there are two main ways, and I get asked this a lot, how I do it. Uh, neither is better than the other, and I've used both. Uh, sometimes we start with words, and sometimes we can start with music. Um, some people will have a preference for one or the other. I usually, but not always, start with music. So that's what I'll begin with here. When we start talking about lyrics in a few weeks, I'll say some things about beginning a song with words, which can be a really beautiful way to go to. In a later video, I'll talk about how to generate musical ideas. Again, noodling around on your instrument is a great way. But right now, I want to make some general remarks about what makes a popular song. That is something that most people recognize as a song and sounds more or less pleasant to the ear, rather than random noise or kind of discordant or dissonant uh, sounds. Uh, so no, no Schoenberg, uh, you know, 12-note uh, avant-garde stuff here. We're talking about songs that people, uh, if you play out in, a, in a, uh, a venue, a bar or something like that, or a restaurant, would want to listen, that most people would want to listen to. So, and, and the, the foundation of this is really the idea of harmony. And the word harmony simply means, um, I looked it up in the music dictionary the other day, it simply means the structure, functions, and relationships of chords. That's all harmony means. And if you play uh, or write songs, you'll understand that there is a, you know, the foundation of it is kind of a chord progression, okay? Um, so that's what we mean by harmony, that movement of the chords underneath the melody and the words uh, and uh, rhythm to the, to the song. 
Now, don't worry, this sounds more technical than we're going to uh, uh, get into for the most part. In this series, I won't go much into music theory, but just a little bit goes a long way. And uh, below, I put a uh, link to a chart of, ta-da, the circle of fifths, which uh, has just magically appeared next to my head on uh, your right, of, to, uh, to the right of my head. If you know even a little music theory, chances are you've come across this circle of fifths. You see it, uh, you see it here on the side of my head, and as much as anything, it's really a songwriting tool. Uh, so let's look at it together. Now, I just want to say, I don't have the circle of fifths next to me ever when I write a song at any point. It's something, though, that, you know, again, if you play enough, if you have written some songs, if you have an ear, if you know your instrument a little bit, you kind of understand and have taken it in. So it's sort of in my bones now. Uh, but we'll talk about some basics of it. Okay. So most of you are probably familiar with the most basic chord progression that underlies a lot of Western music, the 1-4-5 progression. And these numbers, 1-4-5, refer to the tonic, that is the fundamental note of, uh, of a chord in a certain key, okay? So in the C, key of C major, the one chord would be the C major chord, uh, and I hope that you know what a chord is. It's three notes, um, uh, uh, that I, and I'm not going to go into that. I'm not going to take time to go into that right now. Uh, you can look it up. Um, and uh, the vast majority of folk and rock music are based on this, the one, four, and five. They'll throw in other things, but that's sort of the foundational elements of harmony in most Western popular music, okay? The blues is almost entirely based on one, four, and five. Uh, and by the way, the um, one reason for the ubiquity of these three chords as the foundation of Western popular music and that I find this interesting is that together they contain every note in the scale. Okay, and you can work that out for yourself. Write down the three notes of the C chord, the three notes of the G major chord, the three notes of the F major chord. Um, and uh, you'll see that they contain, those three chords contain all uh, of the notes of the C major scale. And for this discussion, we'll, we'll use the key of C, no sharps or flats, just the white keys on the key, piano keyboard. And I'm going to assume, again, that you know what a major and minor triad or chord uh, is. Okay. Now, the outer ring that you see here on the uh, circle of fifths refers to major chords. It lists all 12 major chords, okay? And you can divide this into four quadrants. Okay, so three major chords per quadrant. We'll talk about that. Um, and the inner ring refers to minor chords. Okay, the same thing. They're the same number. For each minor chord, there's a major chord. In fact, what you see is, uh, so inside the C major chord is A minor. A minor is the relative minor a technical term, the relative minor of C major, okay? The A minor scale contains all the notes of the C major scale, but just starting on A rather than on C. So the A minor chord is the relative uh, minor of C major, or we can say this C major is the relative major of A minor, either way, okay? I'm going to assume that you know what intervals are. So, uh, starting at C in the circle of fifths, going clockwise, you go up by an interval of a perfect fifth, okay, at each step. So, G is a fifth above C, okay, and so on. And so, we call the G major chord, if we're in the key of C, five, 
because it's a fifth above C. And here C would be the one chord. Okay. If you go counterclockwise, you're going up a perfect fourth. Okay. So F, which is the first uh, letter counterclockwise from C on the outer ring, F is a fourth above C. It's also the same as going down a perfect fifth. Okay. So look, the C chord, the C major chord in the circle of fifth, is surrounded by the four chord on the left and its five chord on the right. Pretty simple. So you have the one, four, five right there, kind of clustered together in the circle of of fifths. And and that's really uh that's that's really key. The the proximity is is kind of the key to to uh, uh, to what's going on. So, and again, so let me repeat that. This is kind of the secret to uh, the first secret, if you like, to uh, uh, songwriting popular Western songs. Basically, the closer you stay to the one chord, C major in our example, the more harmonious, consonant, pleasant to the ear your progression will sound. And when I say stay closer, it means in the circle of fifths, okay? So the things that are in closest proximity to your tonic chord, in our example, the C chord, uh, will sound the most pleasing. If you mix in, say, a D major chord to your progression, will it still sound nice? Sure. It'll sound slightly less consonant, though, less harmonious, uh, than the G or F chords, okay? And there are technical reasons for that that are really interesting, but that's not the uh, in the scope of, of, of this uh, series right now. Maybe I'll talk about that another time. Next week, we'll talk uh, a lot about spicing up uh, these progressions going beyond the 1, 4, and 5. Uh, and if you don't, it'll start to sound kind of more or less the same. But this is a rough uh, rule, uh, rule number one. The closer you stay on the circle of fifths to the tonic chord, the more consonant the sound. And the further away you go, the more dissonant the sound. It doesn't mean dissonance is bad. Just be aware of what's going on, okay? And keep, keep that in mind. Um, so, um, let me just give you a, a, a kind of quick example, or a couple quick examples. Um, Van Morrison has made um, an incredible career out of staying really close to 1, 4, and 5. Um, uh, most of his songs, as far as I can tell, are stay really pretty tight in that quadrant of the circle of fifths, okay? He uses, he orders them differently, of course. He uses different rhythms. Uh, one famous example of uh, uh, Brown Eyed Girl, uh, of that is Brown Eyed Girl, uh, which probably most of you know. And I'm gonna play just a little bit of it in the original key of, of G major. Uh, so you'll kind of hear how it goes, and then I'll talk about the chords that are involved. I'll sing a little bit. Hey, where we go? Dead where the red can. Down in a hollow, playing a new game. Goes on and on like that, okay? So that was all that was. Now we're not in C major anymore, we're in G major. So it's all still one, four, five, but the one is G now. And the four is C major chord, and the five is D. So, la, 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 la. so G to C, back to G, and then D. Now this is really D7. There's a tiny bit of spice in this, and we'll talk about that next time. But, you know, and it would sound different. Let me just play it with a D instead of D7. 
Everywhere we go That's when the rain came Down in the hollow Playing a new game Now, it still sounds, you can recognize the song and much more so, you know, with the melody and, and the words, but that D7 really does add something. I don't want to get off into that today. That's a subject for next week. But um, basically, this is still, you know, one, four, one, five. Okay? A lot of, a lot of great songs came out of that, just from Van Morrison. Again, mixing in different rhythms, um, tempo, uh, um, even keys, uh, and obviously the words. Neil Young is another example. It keeps largely to, the, you know, close together in the circle of fifths, but less so. He mixes in a lot more. Most early rock from the 50s, Chuck Berry, for example, is really blues based and blues is all about one, four, and five, okay? So the point here is that you can go a real long way with just um, very simple elements in, in your music, okay? And that really is a statement of how incredibly rich music is. And I, I want to make an analogy here. You know, human beings are incredibly good at recognizing faces, right? Um, I don't, it, it, I mean, scientists know how it's done uh, to some extent, but we're really good at facial recognition. Facial recognition. We have the shape of a face, we all have a nose, we have a mouth, eyes, and, um, uh, and so forth. And uh, we kind of put all that together in our brain through our eyes and figure that out. Um, voices, we're still good at. I would say not quite as good. My guess is that there are fewer elements of voices. Of course, there's the tonal range that it's in. There's something about timbre. But, um, you know, you don't have quite as many, many elements as you do in a face. So we're still good at it, but um, what I would, the way I would say it is, a face is a somewhat richer thing than a voice. Okay, so there are more kind of elements to um, uh, to you know grab a hold of and process and put together. Well, music is kind of like a face. There are all these different elements. Again, harmony, melody, rhythm tempo, dynamics, um, you know, and more, and of course the lyrics. So um, that's what fascinates me about music is it's incredibly rich, okay? So let's keep talking about uh, this, this idea of harmony. So coming back to C major, because it's a, the easiest example, what are we to make of the chords on the inner ring that correspond to 1, 4, and 5? These are A minor, D minor, and E minor, as you can see in the chart. Again, they're the relative minor of the 1, 4, and 5 major chords on the outer ring. You will find tons of songs that mix together nothing but the major and minor 1, 4, 5 chords with nothing else. In other words, those six chords in the quadrant, okay, in C major, C, G, F, A minor, D minor, and E minor. Okay, I mixed up the order there a little bit, but you get the idea. Um, one example is Neil Young's song, Rockin' in the Free World, and I'll just play a little bit of the verse of that, okay? So the verse really is just repeating three chords. Neil Young does this in a lot of songs. E minor, D, and C. Okay. Now think about, and you can look at the uh, circle of fifths chart, think about if we're in the key of G major. Okay. What, 
what that would look like. And in fact, let's replace the E minor with its relative major chord, G. It would just be G, D, and C. Okay, that's one, five, four. But we're replacing the tonic with its relative minor. E minor, D, five, and four. Okay. I should say the five and the four of the relative major of E minor. Now it's interesting in the chorus he goes back to G. He's in, so he he alternates between E minor and G major, the verse and the chorus, the relative minor and the major. Okay. But the, the point is he's basically doing one four five. He's just replacing one chord with its relative minor. Okay, which you can again see the proximity of in the circle of fifths chart. Okay, that's it. So he gets a whole new feel out of uh, doing that, replacing one chord with the relative minor. He's still in that quadrant, the G quadrant, G major quadrant that you see in the circle of fifths. Um, but uh, um, but he's. He's just shifting a little bit. That one little element is all it takes, okay? Um, and, you know, and it gives it a new feel, okay? Uh, if you're anything like me, you'll want to go beyond staying in that one quadrant, but I'm not trying to talk you into uh, going outside it. Again, you can write a million songs that are going to be beautiful and all your own, just staying within that quadrant, okay? Um, a lot of giant hits have been written with those six chords alone, in whichever key, so that'll shift the quadrant, but, but with the six chords, um, one, four, five in their relative minor chords. And it's because they sound very harmonious, okay? Um, because they're in close proximity in the circle of fifths. Now, if you want to uh, throw in some dissonance into your song, uh, you can throw something in from the opposite side of the circle of fifths. Uh, if, we're go, if we go back to the key of C major, if you throw in something like a C sharp major chord or D sharp minor, um, uh, by the way, uh, uh, on the chart, it's E flat minor. I play mainly guitar, which is a sharp instrument, uh, so I tend to um, talk in the sharp and harmonic of flat chords. Anyway, you can throw in a C sharp or a D sharp minor. Uh, go ahead, try it out. It'll sound dissonant. It'll be surprising, which is often a nice thing, and we'll certainly talk about that. So, um, Anyway, a couple other examples of sort of staying in this quadrant of uh, six chords um, are uh, a couple of Eagles songs, for example, Peaceful Easy Feeling, Take It Easy, but you, the list goes on and on endlessly, so you can, you can discover your own. In fact, that might be uh, an interesting little exercise for you. So I want to look at a couple of songs of my own uh, that stay kind of close to home in this way, in, in one quadrant. I don't have any songs that use just one, four, and five, but I do have one that uses one, the one chord, the five chord, major chords, and the relative minor of the four chord, okay? So a little bit analogous to Rockin' in the Free World that we just talked about, where Neil Young uses the relative minor of the one chord, in mine, I use the relative minor of the four chord, but that's still in, in our quadrant, right? That's the point, okay? Um, and uh, this is in the key of, uh, of A uh, major. So the one chord is A major, the five chord is E major. Again, you can see this from the circle of fifths, right? Clockwise from one step from A is E. And the four chord would be D major on the other side of E, but we'll substitute, we'll go to the inner circle there and substitute B minor for D major, 
Okay? So the whole song, both the verse and the chorus, is just A, B minor, and E. So it's like one, four, five, but again substitutes the relative minor for the four uh, chord. Again, there are lots of examples of this sort of thing out there. Uh, my song is, uh, I didn't realize until I, after I had written it, but it's sort of shamelessly copied from um, a Neil Young song, or it's similar, I shouldn't say it's copied, but it's similar to a Neil Young uh, song called Out on the Weekend. Uh, in fact, I can, I can play a little bit for you, of that for you. See the lonely boy out on the weekend Trying to make it pay Can't relate to joy he tries to seek and Can't begin to say So now I'll play my song, Peace of Mind, which uh, again is the same chord progression as the Neil Young song I just played, uh, but you know, it has a little different sound, okay? Um, so I'll, I'll just play one verse instrumentally and then I'll sing a verse uh, and maybe, maybe a chorus just to show you how it goes. Uh, you can find the video on my uh, uh, YouTube channel, I'll uh, put a link below. That's one of that's one of my songs that is about as simple as I get the uh, the chord progression and um, for the verse and chorus are exactly the same um, so really simple it's almost one four five just replacing the four chord by its relative minor and that's all um, of course there's more to it than that there is a melody there's words there's tempo there's phrasing all these things. Um, uh, make the song unique and different from that uh, Neil Young song. Now, um, I want to play just a snippet of another song of mine called Too Many Miles. And this one is one that uh, uses all six chords in a, in a uh, quadrant. I, I may have others that do that, but this one is, uh, really stays with that, okay? So in this song, it's in the key of A again, so you're used to seeing where that is on the circle of fifths. Uh, so it has A, E, and D, okay, or A, D, and E, the one, four, five. And it also has B minor, which is the relative um, minor of D, okay, the four chord. It has F sharp minor, which is the relative minor, the tonic, A, and it has C sharp minor, which is the relative minor of E. By the way, the relative minors are always a minor third, if you are familiar with that interval, below the tonic of the relative major. So uh, A is a minor third below C on the scale. Uh, so A minor is the relative minor of C major. 
Uh, again, this uh, song is, there's a video on my channel, so you can see the whole thing. I'll play, um, I guess, um, well, just kind of the first half of it for you, okay? So you'll see how it goes. Again, this is in A, and it starts all major until we get the verses in, in the major uh, chords, and uh, we bring in the uh, relative minor chords in the chorus, so I'll play um, a couple verses and a chorus for you. Rain, rain, make me clean again. Wash away this filth I've been living in. Take me back 500 years or a million, I don't care. I just want to feel clean again. Another black life gone, a brutal Will eyes ever open? Will they ever see? One son's mother sheds tears For yet another is this who won't be Cry for each other For all those who suffer but act So the song goes on from there, another verse. It's a very standard uh, structure, and we'll talk about structure later. Um, but again, I hope you saw how the verses were just those major one, um, in this case, one, five, and four chords, and the, uh, uh, the chorus was uh, uh, still had those chords, but incorporated the relative minors as well, and how that shifts the sound of it. But it also, but it all sounds again pretty close to home harmonically. Okay, it has a, a kind of pleasant um, sound to the ear. You're not getting into anything very crazy, or as I like to say, spicy. Okay, so um, so those are a couple of uh, uh, some examples of what I've been um, uh, talking about today. Um, and we'll end uh, our discussion today with uh, just kind of reiterating a, a, an understanding that the circle of fifths is a kind of map, a harmonic map, showing what chords in a, in a given key are most pleasant sounding or harmonious to the ear and what are more uh, dissonant. It's not about memorizing the circle of fifths or even thinking about it, okay? Um, as you play your instrument more, uh, this fact of music, this basic fact of harmony, will simply become second nature to you. You won't necessarily think about it. It will just become part of your ear and your brain. In fact, it's really the main substance of your ear training. Uh, and next time, we'll talk about going beyond this, about the primary spices uh, that you can add uh, to your songs to go beyond these six chords. I, I think of them as spices, or uh, next week we'll talk about the salt, the basic spices, not getting too far out there, but the salt and pepper of songwriting. And just to go back to the first thing we looked at, Brown Eyed Girl, um, it wasn't purely one, four, five. He added in, remember that D7. So that's just a little taste of salt that Van Morrison put in that song. It's very common to do that, but it just spices up the um, the, har the harmony of, a little bit for that song. So I look forward to uh, uh, seeing you next week, and until then, stay in tune.